Hi, my name's Vince Sheehan. I'd like to talk to you today about Bruckner's Third Symphony, the 1889 version. Bruckner composed it originally in 1873, and it had a disastrous premiere. The conductor who was supposed to direct the music um, fell ill just before the performance, so Bruckner had to step in. And he wasn't a particularly competent orchestral conductor by all accounts. The audience, perhaps already a bit hostile to Bruckner's music, um, decided they didn't like it and they started to leave. And then in the end, even the orchestral players started to leave. Um, the only saving grace really was that a group of students in the gods, including the young Gustav Mahler, who applauded um, Bruckner to the end. It must have been a very painful and humiliating experience for Bruckner. Um, he returned to the score a few years later in 1877 and revised it and then near the end of his life after he composed the 8th symphony he came back to it. Now back to the original version, it's, it's always been called the Wagner Symphony. Bruckner idolised Richard Wagner and indeed he went to visit Wagner with two scores, this one and the score to the second symphony and said look I'd love you to be the dedicatee of one of my symphonies. Why don't you have a look through them and see what you think? So Wagner um, graciously looked through these, uh, these, these manuscripts and he decided he liked the third symphony. He said, it's wonderful, I'd love to be um, you know, the dedicatee of the symphony. Bruckner went home and the next day couldn't remember which one Wagner chose. Was it the second or third? Perhaps they had a few too many beers. There's um, a story going around which suggests that. Anyway, Bruckner had to contact Wagner again and say, look, which one was it, the second or the third? Was it the one with the trumpet? And Wagner suggests the one with the trumpet at the beginning. Best wishes. So that was sorted out. It's quite an amusing story. Um, it, from then on, it was called the Wagner Symphony. And the score was littered with references to Wagner's operas, Lohengrin, uh, Tristan, Tannhäuser, The Ring. Uh, and Bruckner quotes a couple of his own pieces as well. By the time we get to the 1889 version, which I'm looking at today, he took out many of those references, although Wagner's still very much in the background. The other composer who looms large in this music, particularly in the first movement, is Beethoven. Bruckner, um, well, Be Wagner actually idolised uh, Beethoven, particularly his Ninth Symphony, as did Bruckner. And um, it very much suggests the opening bars of Beethoven's Ninth at the beginning of Bruckner's Third. They're both in D minor, of course. The first movement in Bruckner's Third Symphony starts with this um, figuration on the violas. First, that recalls actually another Bruckner symphony as well, the Nalta, which he composed um, between the first and second symphonies. And then quietly, the trumpet, solo trumpet intones the first subject. melody will eventually become the motto theme in this work. It comes back um, at significant moments in, uh, in the symphony. The music builds to a crescendo, just like Beethoven's Ninth. And you think it's going to go into, well, the melody recalls this, doesn't it? It sounds a bit like Beethoven's Ninth so far. But then Bruckner has this pause, which can sound a bit jarring if you're not used to Bruckner's music. Bruckner's not a composer for finely crafted transitions such as Brahms. He tends to stop and then start again. And he brings this new idea in the first subject.
So the first subject consists of that, um, that trumpet tune and this new idea which is blazed out uh, near the beginning of the movement. Eventually we come to the second subject which in Bruckner symphonies is often referred to as the Gesangs Perioda, the it's kind of song section. And the second violins have got the melodic interest here. Notice the triplet crotchet and two straight crotchet rhythm. Da 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 da. Bruckner symphonies often have that um, triplet and two crotchet rhythm or the other way around to crotchet and triplet rhythm um, so listen out for that and then we have the third subject Bruckner is famous for having three subjects in his symphony usually and um, this is a more of a strident melody perhaps more akin to the first subject that rhythm persists, which we heard in the second subject. That, those crotchets and triplets, that very Brucknerian rhythm. We also have this um, kind of new idea of a trumpet, outlines a diminished seventh chord. Da -da. Like that, so listen out for that. And then we come to the end of the exposition and we have the first subject trumpet melody coming back, that motto theme coming back, this time in E major. Um, da, 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 da. It's a real kind of glorious moment. It's like we're on the heights of Val, the castle of Valhalla, um, if you like. Then we come to the codetta. And suddenly we're perhaps amongst the woods on the mountain uh, for Valhalla. Um, Bruckner's codettas are very kind of, they're real linking passages. Um, usually in the codetta, perhaps with Beethoven, it's, it's a sense of rounding off. But with Bruckner, it's taking you somewhere. So we have this idea. Us to the development and like Bruckner's fourth which starts in a similar way we go back to the first movement uh, melody but in a different key this time I think it's in F minor and during the development one of the features is inversion the themes are turned upside down so the first subject is da 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 is da 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 goes the other way we have the other first subject um, melody, which is used to build up to this enormous climax, which is very much the heart of this movement. And the first subject melody, the trumpet tune, the motto theme is belted out in unison, it's a very Brucknerian theme, um, like this. extended um, you know we're in the tonic um, in the middle of the development that's something Bruckner does in a couple of his other symphonies usually you'd expect the tonic at the beginning of the recapitulation um, you might be you might recall Bruckner's ninth a similar thing happens then we have a version of the second subject, turned upside down. Like that. And then eventually the development draws to a close. We have the recapitulation, which is fairly standard. 
first sec subject, second subject, third subject, we have a brief codetta, more of a linking passage to a coda, where the um, motto theme is belted out on the brass. And we have these bare fifths underneath. We kind of, um, in rock music, you'd call it a power chord. We have a D and an A. Which of course again recalls the opening Beethoven's Light Symphony. Etc. It's a powerful ending to this movement, it's a, it's a really great coda, and that those bare fifths have a real elemental quality to them. We then get to the second movement. The second movement's in a sonata form based really on three ideas. Um, a kind of sonata form, it's, it's not straightforward. We have the first subject, we're in E flat major, so we're in D minor, now we're in E flat major, upper semitone, and this goes like this, the first subject. by this rising and descending idea. And so on. And that um, builds and builds. Um, particularly that da, 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 that keeps coming back until we reach the second subject, a change in meter and a change in key in E flat major now and we're in 3-4 and we have this rather charming elegant idea on the violas to a codetta. Again, like a sudden shifting key again, and we're in, um, uh, we, we have this. Sounds almost classical, like from a Haydn symphony or something. That codetta then brings us to the development, because the development actually starts developing the codetta first. Um, you know, there are some examples of symphonies that do, do that. I think of Mozart's Jupiter Symphony develops the codetta before the other um, themes. And that really piles up that um, development into some quite um, emotional climaxes. The development's purely based on the codetta and the second subject. Eventually, the first subject returns and it's greatly extended and the second and third subjects are sorry the second and codetta are omitted in the recapitulation they are in the original version but the book was taken them out here in this, this 1889 version there's one very special moment in this um, movement it's one of my favorite moments in the whole symphony right at the end of the recapitulation, we suddenly have a paraphrase of um, a leitmotif from Die Walküre, Wagner's second ring opera, and uh, it's like this, it's beautiful, it suddenly drops, the, 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 the dynamics drop, we have this. Ascending chromatic chord progression. And then we hear this chord and the winds after that, which is of course an E flat major chord. 
but this chord and this progression is actually referencing this. Which is the, um, the magic sleep motif from the end of the Valkura, which I've always loved anyway. So I think it's the most beautiful chord progression. And uh, that's um, a quotation from a Wagner opera that survived into the final version. Then we're into the third movement, a very straightforward, typical Brucknerian scherzo. Again, perhaps reminiscent of Beethoven's Ninth as well. We have this uh, idea in second violins. Then we have this. Um, something like that anyway. That's the main scherzo idea. Full of this elemental power. Da da dum dum da da dum dum. It really powers the music along, that rhythm. Then like Brook Bruckner scherzos, we have this contrasting moment in the A section. Um, goes like this. Um, so listen out for that. But we're still in the first section. We return to the fury of the opening idea. And then the trio. We're into A major. And um, we have this rather charming idea. Um, boisterous, folky kind of tune, which Bruckner specialised in, in his scherzos. Then we have a reprise of section A. The original version, the 1873 version, has this um, rather wonderful coda attached, but for whatever reason Bruckner didn't want to keep that in the final version. And this brings us on to the finale, the fourth movement. We start off with these kind of chromatic ideas. And we have this very stark idea, first subject. Um, perhaps recalls the uh, opening of the first movement. Then we have this elegant second subject. It's really charming, actually. Uh, to the kind of Austrian countryside there. And th then we have connected to that, there's a, a chorale idea as well. And then, like many Bruckner movements, we're into the third subject. And this is, <laughs> if you're not used to Bruckner, this is a real jarring moment, okay? I'm just warning you. Um, although I imagine you know already if you're watching this video, but the, um, <laughs> we have a break. And I still have trouble getting used to this now. We have this, uh, uh, we have that wonderful, charming second subject idea, and then we have this. Um... Well, I didn't play it very well, but that kind of... Da, da, na, na. And then underneath that, it's kind of off the beat. Da, na, 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 na. It's really kind of strident, it's really in your face, and it's, it's almost comical. I'm sure Brooklyn didn't um, intend that, but that's how it comes across to me. Um, so that's first, second, second subject, third subject. There's no development in this movement. We do have a transition passage here, which takes us to the first subject again. Um, and then... In this first subject recapitulation, we hear Wagner again, we hear like this... We hear Loga from Rheingold, perhaps, you know, this, these descending chromatic ideas. And it kind of goes like that. If you listen out for that, you can you hear the, the fire of the ring coming through. 
we have um, another, between the first and second subject recapitulation, there's um, another quite substantial transition, this and that for the pizzicato strings. melody in the cellos. It's about for that. It's quite a lovely moment actually. Um, and that leads us to the second subject proper. And then Bruckner omits the third subject, but well, he, he kind of is there, but it's mixed with the first subject. It, I'd call it a codetta. It's a mixture of the two first and third subjects. And then that brings us to the end of the work. We have the, the motto theme again in a glorious and radiant D major this time. A tremendous ending to the symphony.